All right. Hello, epidemics. This cartoon, I actually just, uh, it was just published this week, brand new. And I thought it was kind of relevant to our discussion. Um, yes, ground squirrels are a reservoir for the Black Plague. I couldn't resist showing it to you guys. All right. So again, we've got stuff due this week. It's just a quiz and a journal entry, nice and easy. Um, the project is going to be due before midnight on Sunday, March 1st. And we're gonna have presentations probably on April 26th and 28th. So I'm gonna be sorting through who's doing what for the project. And we'll be setting up those presentations um, sometime in the next week. I'll be sending out emails to those of you who want to do a presentation. All right. So we've been talking about, of course, the origins of the Black Death or the bubonic plague or the second great plague pandemic. Anybody have questions from last time? Nope, okay. So when we're talking about this, what are, have we been seeing? The kinds of things that we've been seeing over and over again that increase risks of pandemics and that we see with the Black Death? Widespread travel and trade. Travel and trade, yes. Or other movements of people. So refugees can also be um, something that we see. Nate, go ahead. Natural disasters. Yep. Natural disasters, absolutely. Especially if they cause exposure to wildlife, particularly exposure that hasn't been there before. We also see uh, crowding, crowded conditions increase the spread of a disease. And one that we mentioned here, Nate, go ahead. Uh, this one kind of ties into, oh, were you going to say something, Jerry? War? War. Go ahead, Nate. Sorry, bro. Deforestation. Deforestation. Yep. When we talked about the Black Death. Uh, education. Is, would be un, uneducation be a part of it? And non-educated people? I don't know how to phrase it correctly. Lack of education? Lack of education is something that we see that contributes to the COVID pandemic, absolutely. Um, however, during the Black Death, we didn't even understand germ theory yet. So lack of education or lack of knowledge, let's say. I believe they were under the miasma theory. Yes. The gross air. Yes. Painted air. That's exactly what people believed at this time. And we're going to talk about the miasma theory in a little bit. What was going on in Europe at this time period? Conflict. The temperatures were cooling. No. Oh, that's yes. right. The, the great warming. The opposite of that. The opposite right? of great warming. The yeah. cooling. Yes, the cooling. And what did that cause? Less starvation? Yes. Malnutrition. Malnutrition. So that would be from famine? Is that kind of what you're getting at, Jerry? Nutrition and starvation. Yeah. Um, the temperatures are not conducive to crops growing. And it's, you know less crops 
Yep. Absolutely, because malnutrition, starvation, famine, which I cannot spell this morning, um, all of that weakens your immune system. Your immune system's not working as well. You're going to get hit harder. And it wasn't like they had the ideal balanced diet back then either. So, well, probably some parts of the world had a pretty good balanced diet, some parts not so much. It's certainly not the kind of diet that we have today. Certainly, they didn't generally have as much food availability or as much diversity, um, but humans can live a reasonably long lifespan on less than ideal diets. Remember these people, some of these people were living into their 60s, 70s, and even 80s. So, we called the, this particular disease, Yersinia pestis, is called the plague. Not capitalized. But we have the word plague kind of in our vocabulary these days, right? We hear terms like plague of locusts or avoid like the plague, which we all know is uh, <clears throat> a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> so we've got, we've taken the term for this particular disease and generalized it for really horrible events. Because a plague of locusts, when you actually have a massive swarm of them, they can destroy all the crops in an area and lead to mass starvation. Um, you avoid something like the plague because it's life threatening. Although we've kind of forgotten that part these days. So we've mentioned most diseases tend to affect the young, the elderly, and the less healthy. And they're more likely to affect the poor than the wealthy classes. Plague, kind of like the 1918 flu, strikes down young, healthy adults. What happens when you lose the young, healthy adults in a population? Workforce is um, affected. Workforce is affected, absolutely. Julia, go ahead. Um, well, young, healthy adults, they're not gonna be able to produce more, contribute to the population. Is that yeah, okay. they're not going to be having children. Absolutely. What else, though? I mean, what if they've already got children? Orphan kids. More orphan kids. Yes. So when the plague came through, it would leave lots of orphans. The 1300s. Not a great time to be orphans. I mean, there's never a great time to be orphans, but sometimes the times were harder than others and they were pretty, pretty challenging during this time period. Okay, so screenshot time. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the biology, what the Black Death does, what forms of Black Death there are. Okay, so there are 
three forms of the plague. There's the pneumonic version, septicemic version, and the bubonic version. Bubonic was, of course, the version that was most common during the Black Death. So let's talk about these three. Pneumonic. This version was very common during the Black Death. So even though we think of it as a bubonic plague, there was a lot of the pneumonic plague. Does anybody have an idea what pneumonic refers to? Respiratory system. Yes, the respiratory system. So this is inhaled bacteria affecting the respiratory system. So you would get a fever, respiratory um, symptoms, coughing, chest congestion. But in the case of the pneumonic plague, this includes coughing up blood. You get headaches and about three to seven days, you would develop pneumonia, which is a severe infection of the lungs, which is definitely life-threatening. Even today, pneumonia is life-threatening. And this form of the plague can be caught from rodents, obviously, um, or dogs and cats that went outside. Back then, everybody's dogs and cats went outside. It can also spread human to human. Untreated, even today, the pneumonic form of the Black Death has a case fatality rate of nearly 100%, as early as two days after symptoms appear. So if you are symptomatic with the pneumonic plague, your chances of survival are very, very low. Julia, do I see your hand up? Yeah, I was just wondering, I had a question about pneumonia. Yes. Well, I know, obviously, you didn't really have a chance back then if you got it. But today, like in present day, even if you get treatment, is there still a chance that you can um, die from it? Or is it a thing that like treatment can basically help? Treatment can definitely help, help but a lot of people do die from pneumonia. I don't have <laughs> statistics or numbers for you there, but it is something that kills a good percentage of people uh, who get various kinds of respiratory infections. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So if you get the, if you're elderly or immune compromised and you get the flu, it progresses to pneumonia, that can be fatal even with treatment today. Nate, go ahead. Um, I know there's a shot you can get for pneumonia, like a vaccine, but it's only for like one strain, right? And is that viral or a bacterial? I think that's pneumococcal pneumonia, which is yep. a bacteria. You're right. That, that rings a big bell. You're right. So it's, it's a form of bacterial pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonias tend to be deadlier than viral pneumonias. And pneumococcal pneumonia is one of the, one of the most deadly versions. Not the only one, however. So because this can spread from human to human, it can spread through inhalation and it is so deadly. These strains that can produce the pneumonic plague 
are of interest to bioterrorism researchers. Because it can be produced in a form that you could theoretically fill a subway system with it. Put it in the air handling system of, of, of a building or something. And it looks like the flu at first. So, you know, people are like, oh, I've got the flu. I'm just going to stay home a couple of days. But the high mortality and the fast mortality, um, you know, make it a good, a good, there's no such thing as a good disease for bioterrorism, but it makes it one of the scarier ones. The CDC classifies. Okay, Nate, go ahead. You know stuff about this, right? <laughs> yeah, you said like the dispersal method, like mm -hmm. that, that's like an aerosol form, right? Yes. Yeah. The CDC has classified this as a category A or tier one potential bioterrorist uh, disease, which is the most dangerous category. So this is definitely has the potential to be more dangerous than, than most um, potential bioterrorism diseases. So would that be handled in a BSL-4 facility? Absolutely, yes. This would definitely be a BSL-4 disease. I can write for, there you go. Okay, so the fact that the strain that was going around during the Black Death could spread this way, that could infect the lungs, is one of the reasons that particular uh, pandemic was so, so deadly. All right, screenshot. Septicemic. Anybody know what septicemic or septicemia is? Blood, something to do with blood? Yes. It's a life-threatening infection of the blood. This is the, yeah, go ahead. Is that kind of related, that SCP prefix, like sepsis, is it kind of like related to that? Yes, yep. Uh, this is the rarest form of the plague, the plague, but may follow either pneumonic or bubonic. So if you survive the pneumonic plague, but it gets into your bloodstream, this also has a case fatality rate near 100%. Nasty Un stuff. Untreated or with treatment? Treatment, um, modern treatment brings the mortality rate down to um, between five to 15%. But untreated, it is usually fatal in 24 hours. I mean, to be honest, I'm surprised we survived as a species the way it's telling these, because they didn't even know how to combat it. Like Australia probably saved us because they was isolated. <laughs> <laughs> So what kind of symptom? Okay, so this is one that can also be spread by the bite of fleas, right? Symptoms. This is a nasty one. You ready? Bleeding under the skin and from the mouth, nose, and rectum. rectum. Um, very, very high fevers, 
So we're talking 103 to, whoops, 105. At this point in adults, that can cause brain damage. Children can survive higher temperatures than adults can, but in adults, we're talking brain damage. Chills, vomiting, including bloody vomit. Um, gangrene in arms and legs, blood vessels, leak, and you can get, um, yeah, go ahead, Nate. So gangrene, I've, I've seen that before. Is that basically just necrosis, like of the tissues? That's exactly what it is. Gangrene is death and rotting of tissues. And that's because of the blood vessels of bleeding and not getting the blood to the tissue. Exactly, exactly, Jerry. The blood vessels are not working right. The blood is not getting to those extremities like your feet and your hands. And so the tissues there are just, they're starving to death. Is that kind of, I know it's not the exact same, but is, is that the concept similar to frostbite? Like why people Absolutely. lose appendages? Okay. Yes, yes. Frostbite is a milder form of gangrene, but absolutely that happens. You get purple spots on the skin from the bleeding underneath the skin. Those purple spots were called tokens, oops, of God's anger. So if you had these purple blotches on your skin, looking like a very, very dark purple bruise, that was a sign that God was mad at you. Was that what leprosy was or is that a different thing? That's a different thing. Okay. Yeah. Strangely enough, leprosy is not, well, I mean, leprosy is not nearly as dangerous as the plague. Um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting disease, but it doesn't have a high mortality rate, despite how people were afraid of it. Leprosy, that's a skin related thing, right? Like kind of yeah. like smallpox, but not really. I think it looks different than smallpox, um, but it is a skin, a skin infection, yes. So the bacteria, Yersinia pestis, produces something called an endotoxin. Well, right there in the name, toxin. Endo. Nate, yeah. I'm, I'm going to hit the mute on uh, you. Lucas, uh, I think that's you in the, I'm hearing background stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, which causes coagulation of blood as well as the leaking of blood vessels. So not only are your blood vessels leaking, but you're getting clots inside of your veins the ones that are still intact. So not very common, but pretty nasty. Okay, good time for screenshot. bubonic is the most common form of the plague, including during the Black Death. But it's also the most common form throughout all of history. I'm going to read you a description by a Franciscan monk who was a chronicler. His name was Michael of Piazza, and he wrote the burn blisters appeared and boils developed in different parts of the body, on the sexual organs, in others on the thighs or on the arms, and in others on the neck. 
At first, these were the size of a hazelnut and the patient was seized by violent shivering fits, which soon rendered him so weak that he could no longer stand upright, but was forced to lie on his bed, consumed by a violent fever and overcome by great tribulations. Soon the boils grew in size to the size of a walnut, then to that of a hen's egg or a goose's egg, and they were exceedingly painful and irritated the body, causing it to vomit blood by vitiating the juices. The blood rose from the affected lungs to the throat, producing a putrefying and ultimately decomposing effect on the whole body. The sickness lasted three days, and on the fourth, at the latest, the patient succumbed. That doesn't sound very good, does it? All right, so I have a picture. You guys ready? Nate, I see your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, just a question, those buboes, I think they're called, was it actually beneficial to pop them or drain them before they became too large? Not to my knowledge. So these are the buboes. And here's some of that gangrene we were talking about and that purple under the skin bleeding. Okay, so bubonic plague. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Those buboes in the picture, like what is that? Are those like lymph nodes or something? Um, yes, they are. They are swollen lymph nodes. Good catch. We're going to get to that. All right, so starts as a blister. There are also red pock marks. So kind of like what you see with smallpox. As all of these, high fever, nausea, headache, vomiting. This one has thirst. The buboes, am I spelling that one right? are swollen lymph nodes. So have we, have I explained lymph nodes to you guys? Do you guys remember them? Nope, okay. So humans have, we all know that humans have blood vessels and a heart, but we also have a series of vessels called lymph vessels. And there's no pump involved here. But these are involved in moving fluids around the body. A lot of water gets moved this way. These are also pathways for white blood cells to move around. And these lymph vessels have the nodes. And the lymph nodes are a wider area where the inside is kind of sponge-like or net-like. And that is designed to catch bacteria that it's moving through the lymph system and cancer cells that are trying to spread through the body. So these bacteria or cancer cells get caught in the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes then um, fill with white blood cells who are attacking the bacteria or attacking the cancer cells and they swell. So with buboes, they're larger than the typical ones. We have lymph nodes like kind of under the jawline, the back of the, the neck. If you get throat infections like strep, you might feel these are swollen. 
they're in the armpits, they're in the groin area, the top of the thighs. Um, yeah, top of the thighs area. There are other places as well, but those are the ones that we're most likely to feel or um, see. So those buboes, the swollen lymph nodes, um, they were painful and sometimes they would burst. Literally, they would get so full of bacteria and white blood cells that they would break open the skin. And it smelled horrible. Not a big surprise, horrific bacterial infection, skin dying, there was a distinctive odor to the Black Death. People could smell it. And not just like your doctor or somebody living in your house, but if a city was infected, the whole city would smell. Um, This form spread by flea bites. Without treatment, case fatality rate of this is between 30 and 90%. And death would happen within 10 days. Professor, could a person pass it to another person? Not as easily as they could pass uh, the pneumonic plague, but okay. certainly contact with, for example, bloody vomit or um, the fluid from a burst bubo. You could certainly pick it up by, by contacting these kinds of fluids. So it was more likely to get spread to people like doctors, nurses. At this time, that was largely your family members who were taking care of you. Yeah. Because was plastic even invented then? Did they have? Oh plastic? no, nope, they had nope, like nope. gloves, maybe or whatever. They had sheep belly gloves. <laughs> I don't think they. <laughs> I think the only kinds of gloves they had were like um, leather. And that's not a very good protection. And they didn't know to use something like that. They didn't have that knowledge. Also, oh, just all raw hands on everything. Raw hands, yes. Wow. <laughs> Even during surgeries. Okay, screenshot. So again, these are swollen lymph nodes here. And this is some of that, that gangrene and that purple token of God's wrath. Okay, so why is plague so deadly? What makes it deadlier than a lot of other things? So first I'm gonna define for you virulence factors. What is virulence? I think I've defined that one for you. Strength of the virus. Yep. Severity of the disease caused. So a virulence factor Something that makes a disease worse. In the case of um, plague, there was that endotoxin that would break down blood vessels. And there was also an enzyme or protein that helped 
why pestis evade the host immune system. And these are pretty common in bacteria, things that allow the bacteria to kind of hide from the immune system. Go ahead, Nate. Just to clarify that term virulence, I know it looks like the word virus, but it can be applied to all forms of pathogens, right? Yes, absolutely. Virulence factors can be found in bacteria, viruses, even parasites. Yes. And with the plague, once the bacteria it increases its numbers, so there's a lot of bacteria in the body, they literally attack white blood cells. So they're attacking the cells of your immune system. So you can see they, they produce a toxin that, that damages the body. They have an enzyme that helps them hide from the immune system. And then they also go after and try and destroy white blood cells. They try and destroy your immune system. In addition to this, when the Black Death came through Europe, it was one of those virgin soil, oil, soil epidemics. Europe had not been exposed to the plague since the plague of Justinian, which was quite a while back in history. So nobody was still alive from the plague of Justinian. So everyone was vulnerable. There was nobody that had any immunity. Now, if you survived, then you would have some resistance to reinfection. which means that once plague came through a city, the survivors were less likely to be reinfected. But recovery was long. There was often permanent damage, such as paralysis, deafness, vision loss, and of course, psychological trauma, PTSD. I mean, think about it. If plague comes through and wipes out 90% of your friends and family, yeah, that's going to cause some serious trauma. All right, so screenshot. So I think I got my slides out of order, but so we'll come back to that last one in a second. That's the reservoir in their belly that's being blocked. You were saying, Professor? Yeah, that's a blood meal in the belly. Reservoir refers to an animal that can be infected without a large, loss of population. So a species that can survive having this infection and they can maintain that disease in their population. Nate, go ahead. So they're like the ideal host, like ideal carriers in a sense. Yeah, yeah, we can call them carriers, absolutely. And of course the reservoirs 
are rodents. Um, lots of different species of rodents can, can do this, including marmots or groundhogs, ground squirrels, rats, gerbils, mice. Plague will kill prairie dogs, however. So prairie dogs can catch it, but it will kill them. But the vector in this case is the flea. So the vector is usually an insect that carries the disease from one host to another. In the case of the plague, when we're talking about humans being infected, the flea bites rodents and then goes and bites people and it's carrying that disease from one to the other. Now I did give you that sneak peek about what's going on in the fleas. Nate, go ahead. Just to clarify, so the fleas on the rats, so the, the rats were kind of just transporting the fleas or were the rats infected too? Cause I, 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 I kind of got confused about that. Okay, yeah, so the rats are infected, but they're not, dying in large numbers. And it's not like the rats are biting humans and giving them the play. It's the fleas. Okay. It's the fleas. Gotcha. Yes. Now, we're going to have to talk a little bit about the rat story as well. That's going to be, I think, the next slide. Okay. So, Please get plagued. <laughs> they have symptoms. The bacteria multiply in the digestive tract and the bacteria block the flea's esophagus, the, the, the tube that leads from the mouth to the stomach. So the flea tries to, flea, tries to feed, it cannot swallow, so it ends up regurgitating or vomiting blood and bacteria into the wound. So the flea is infected and the bacteria is in its digestive tract. So when it vomits, some bacteria is going into the bite wound where they just bit the person or they, the rodent or whatever animal they've bitten. Because the flea cannot swallow, the flea is hungry, it's starving. So it becomes more aggressive and bites more frequently. Eventually it dies of usually dehydration. Dehydration will kill you faster than starvation. And that's true for fleas as well as people, um, or they will starve to death. So that's the flea's role as the vector. Screenshot time. Okay, I'm gonna go back to one of these white screens. All right. When we're talking about rats in the 1300s, there's something called the peridomestic rat. The Latin name, Ratus, ratus. You guys know what domestic means? Your dog. Lost. Yeah, your dog, your cat, they're domestic. They've learned to live 
with people, around people, they're dependent on people. So ratus ratus generally um, is more comfortable with people. So it's moderately comfortable around people. They tend to live in cities, in houses, and that kind of stuff. And this is also known as the black rat, which is an excellent climber. So they would often live up in the roof, um, very adaptive. And during the 1300s was widespread. This was an excellent reservoir for plague. And these rats were so comfortable around people, a lot of people would make pets out of their house rats. So they would literally feed them, teach them tricks, pet them. And at the time, you know, it worked out until the plague came along. So, There is another rat that is very common around cities and communities and houses called the brown rat or ratus norvicus or the Norway rat. And these guys are not as good reservoirs for plague. And they're aggressive and they're larger and they're not peri-domestic. They're not semi-domesticated. So the brown rat eventually displaced the black rat kind of after the, the, the Black Death. And the replacement of the Black Rat by the Brown Rat is one of the things that allowed the second plague pandemic to kind of fade a little bit and not continue at the same severity as the year of annihilation, the beginning of the Black Death. Okay. Now, rats can survive longer time periods infected with plague, but many will still die. So large numbers of dead rats was a warning sign. The plague was coming. The fleas on rats prefer rats. But when rats die, those rat fleas will go after humans. And fleas are sensitive. They can detect body heat. They can detect carbon dioxide, which we exhale, and they can detect vibrations. So they can find a new host pretty easily. I don't see how I can eat after this class today. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this is just so gross. <laughs> yeah, this is a bad one. When humans died of plague, the bodies were being prepared for burial. Please on the human, what do you think on the on the recently deceased human? What do you think they would do? Jump on the people burying the yep. dead bodies. Jump onto live hosts and spread the disease. And there are fleas that specialize on humans. So human specialist fleas can survive in clothing and, and bedding for up to six weeks without a meal. What? So their food and water is one thing. They don't drink water separate from blood? Do they get both from one thing? Yeah, basically, yep. Wow. Scary, man. Yep. And of course, during the medieval period, fabric was the scarcity. People, if you had two outfits, you were pretty wealthy. You wore your clothes until they were literally falling off of your body. So clothing and bedding tended to be passed on to family members or sold, taking the fleas with it. Nowadays, we can throw the clothes in the dryer and the heat from the dryer will kill the rat, the fleas. Okay, screenshot time. Okay. So when we talk about the spread of the Black Death in Europe, which is where we really have the information, we've already said it arrived from Asia to the city of Kaffa here on the shore of the Black Sea. And it went by boat to places like Constantinople, down into the Mediterranean, to lots of Italy. Italy was hit really hard and kind and kind of early, but there was also trade up through the Atlantic to England and it carried, and these ships would carry fleas and the plague up all the way up here into Scandinavia. During this time period, there were lots of monasteries. Monasteries at this time period were, would often be used as hotels. Um, they would be locations for trade and sale of grains and other goods, as well as refuges for people in need. So people would flee plague, take their clothes, their grains, flee to the monasteries and start spreading plague to the other people in the area. All right, how are we doing besides grossed out? I'm just surprised we really survived this. I don't understand how we survived this as a species, I don't get it. If there were airplanes really around, <laughs> it would have been over. Yeah, you've got, you've got part of it there. Um, part of it is also that even if only 10% of the population would survive when the plague came through, like you mentioned, it wasn't spreading incredibly fast. It also required large, relatively large communities to spread. So people who lived in more rural areas 
their communities would not be big enough to spread the plague. So they weren't even getting infected if they lived in a little village with maybe 1,000 people, 2,000 people. That wasn't enough to support the plague. So that's a lot of why we survived. And of course, when you survive, if you were infected, you get resistance. And we haven't really talked about this yet, but we're gonna talk about it with malaria. People who tend to survive the plague or malaria often have genetic mutations that help them survive. So they'll have some unique genetic characteristics. So if you survive, you're the one having kids and you're passing on those unique genetic characteristics, which means the next generation is more likely to survive. And waves of the plague will reinforce those genes in the population. We'll see this, we'll talk about this a lot when we talk about malaria. It's related to a couple of conditions like sickle cell anemia and what is it, beta thalassemia, a couple of, of things that are, are blood disorders that provide an increased survival risk against malaria. Um, so we will definitely talk about that. Because that's a it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. Okay. So I've been talking about how Yersinia pestis is a bacteria. And we've talked before about viruses. What is a bacteria? A living organism. Yes, a bacteria is a living organism. Generally, they live- Prokaryotic. Oh, good job. They tend to be single celled. So these are individual bacteria and each one of these is an independent living thing. When you see two like this that look almost like they're connected here, that is one that's in the process of dividing. Prokaryotic. Nate, go ahead. Are these also bacilla bacteria, like the pill-shaped ones? Yes, rod Biology, it's coming back to me now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what is prokaryotic? Single cell, uh, I think there's certain characteristics that they lack. Um, nuclei, I don't know, I think all cells have a nucleus. Oh, no, okay, okay, no nucleus. Uh, yep. Lack of flagellum. No. Okay. Nope. Basically, no nucleus. Um, usually, what this means is they are much simpler cells than the cells that make up our body. Our cells have a nucleus, they have all these little structures inside that have different functions. In bacteria, it's not like that. So, if I were to draw. It's more primitive, essentially. Yeah, it is absolutely more primitive. So generally speaking, it's a, a, a cell with a circular DNA. So this is a genetic material, it's in a circle. Um, and there are other things in the cell, but not a lot. No, no other really big structures involved. No organelles? I remember no that. organelles. Are those dots you just drew ribosomes? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Okay, so they can, they can manufacture proteins, they can reproduce, 
they can cause uh, they can cause disease or they can they can consume various things. They they eat lots of different things. Um, there's no brain involved. They're not thinking. They're not. They're not capable of anything complicated. So unlike viruses are considered to not be living organisms, but bacteria are. Yes. Wow. Right, because there's no metabolic system for viruses. They could just be frozen forever and ever and ever and come back to life and cause destruction. Pretty much. I know that viruses meet some categories of a living thing, but you have to reach all those criterion in order to be classified as living. Yep. Also, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nate. <laughs> So yeah, viruses are not considered living, but bacteria are. But they both can kill us. So I don't care who's alive or not. It's as long as it makes me dead, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> Intracellular parasite, right? That's what they're called, viruses. Yeah. Yes, yes. Not all viruses kill people. Not all bacteria cause disease. In fact, most bacteria do not cause disease. Some are beneficial to humans too, right? Like penicillin, stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, um, some are beneficial like penicillin, but we also have the microbiome. You guys heard of the microbiome? Um, I don't know what it is. Okay. A small like, area of living or plane or it, something. Isn't it like in your gut or something? I yes. thought that. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's not just in your gut, but the microbiome is made up of bacteria, fungi, and other organisms that live on or inside our bodies and do not usually cause disease. Many of the bacteria in the microbiome are actually critical for our survival, especially in the digestive tract. So bacteria, digestive tract, critical for our survival. If you truly sterilized and killed all of the bacteria in your digestive tract, you would die. Absolutely. They do things like um, modify vitamins so we can use them. So there's things that we eat that we have that have to be modified before our body can use them and bacteria do that. Um, they help with digestion and they help fight off harmful bacteria. If you have a healthy gut bacteria and you take in a bacteria or a virus that causes digestive problems, your bacteria are your first line of defense. They will try and prevent that invading bacteria from establishing. Julia, go ahead. Um, so like, is an example of this like E. coli? Yes, yes. E. coli is one of the bacteria that we all have in our digestive tract. There are strains of E. coli that can cause disease. And there are strains of E. coli that are good for us. So when we start talking about bacteria, 
the the concept of species when we look at animals we say okay that is a dog that is a cat that is a hummingbird that is a person those are distinct species when you get down to bacteria it gets more complicated than that so we say that there are different strains of bacteria. So we've kind of got a set amount of genetic material that if a bacteria has 90% of the genetic material that is defined as E. coli, we'll call it E. coli. But it can have a additional bits of DNA, which I wasn't going to get to today, but let me let me uh, let me do this real quick. Come on. There can be little tiny pieces of additional DNA in side the bacteria. And this additional DNA, those are called plasmids. And I really, really, really want to wait till next week to talk about these because we're down to the last seven minutes of class and this is part of the next topic. And it's kind of, kind of intense. We're going to talk about them when we talk about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. So this is probably, you guys have had some good questions today. This is probably a good place to stop because like I said, the next topic is kind of big and I don't want to get started um, on it and not be able to finish it in one sitting. Anything else you guys need to know about the, um, what, we, what we've talked about, the biology of the plague? Can't wait to hear about who figured out how to work this out and cure it or make us more resistant. Can't wait. Monday? No, Tuesday? Tuesday, we're going to be talking about antibiotics. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Okay. If nobody else has anything, we'll leave a little bit early. Nate, you have a question? Yeah, just real quick, when we go into antibiotics, will we also talk about why or how bacteria can Actually, become uh, resistant to certain so medications? Yes. Sweet, thanks. Yes. All right. See everybody next time then. Thank have you. Have a good day, Professor. Bye. Thank you.